Yep. Are you guys all um, good to go for work? Everybody uh, ready to start again or anybody been laid off? Um, Mike told me the earliest I would be starting would be May 12th. And that's if we open on June 1st. Oh, is that ready? Yeah. Oh, that's not too bad. At least you have a couple weeks to kill. Yep. There's a petition going around right now to allow golf in Ontario, and that's almost f filled out. So yeah, we should be opening pretty soon, but... I think so. There'll be uh, there's so many alternatives to uh, to you know maintain distancing and still play golf. So I yeah. don't think I don't think it'll be uh, a problem for too long. Nope. Hey, Caden, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. good. Welcome. Thanks. Everybody can see the screen all right? Yep. Awesome. Oops. Well, it's supposed to be beautiful out today. 18 degrees today, tomorrow 16 on Wednesday. I hope your drains are clear. Yeah. <laughs> The kids were out biking yesterday and managed to find, uh, I'll call it a puddle, but it looked a lot more like a lake down uh, around the public school. So my youngest boy took a bet for 17 bucks, dove into it. <laughs> <laughs> Eight years old, he comes back freezing cold, like Sub-Zero, soaked to the bone with just a shit-eating grin on his face. I made 17 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hey, at least he's making money during this time. That's right. <laughs> Entrepreneurial mind, I guess. Yeah. yeah. The price of pneumonia. <laughs> anyway. So how did uh, how did your last block go? Uh, it was fun. Which one was it? Construction with Dave. Ah, right on, right on. Yeah. That's got to be difficult doing this online. Yeah, it was... Uh... It was interesting. Definitely a learning curve, I think, for both us and Dave. But yeah, <clears throat> yeah. No, there. I used to teach that course. I would. I taught that course before uh, giving it to Dave. And uh, there's still quite a bit of technical work that you can do. You know, the uh, um, particle sizing analysis and all that sort of stuff is pretty interesting. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Seeing if you can avoid that choker layer, save your club some money. Mm -hmm. Morning, guys. Morning. Is that James I see? Uh, I go by Darren, but uh, yeah, that's me. How are you, buddy? How are you feeling these days? Oh, man. It's been an up and down uh, ride the last week and a half, but uh, I'm here. I'm ready to finish this out. So, well, glad to hear you push through, man. It's a a pretty weird time to have respiratory issues. Let me tell you. Yeah, I hope you're uh, you're not working. You're staying home. I hope. Uh yeah, I'm not. I'm not working, and I think he's just got a bare bones crew going to be pulling tarps this week. Uh, him and the mechanic and his two kids, I think, is all that's going to be out there. So that's going to be a challenge. I'm sure we usually have about 13 to 15 people out there in one day pulling tarps. So Yeah. Oh, well, do what you got to do, I guess. Well, I, I drove by today, and it looks like there's uh, quite a bit of snow that's gone off of them. So uh, that's a good sign. Yeah. I should give him a call. Maybe I can sneak up there. I'm going a bit stir crazy over here. Yeah, <laughs> isn't everyone? I know. Um, the, just on Twitter, Jason was posting that there's been a lot of uh, water puddles everywhere else. So he's been dealing with that, the massive runoff and all his dugouts and everything is full. So they're dealing with yeah, that. Yeah, I can't last long. I just uh, drove by there today. And uh, this morning I was out there 
just driving by to see what it looked like and uh it like the third fairway is a puddle from front to end it's oh wow it, yeah but that's always the low the low spot there we got a drain pipe but it's still there's a lot of uh water coming off the course for sure yeah yeah coyote creek's gonna be well this week i'll help melt but we uh yesterday there were still about 22 inches snow down there at the river so wow that's quite a bit well it's supposed to be 16 degrees all day today and sunny yeah. so uh that stuff's gonna go quick yeah the puddles aren't gonna get any smaller i don't think today <laughs> no <laughs> I'll we'll give it a few more minutes. We've got about 14 people, I guess, online so far. So with your class with Dave, did you guys stay online right till 1220 every day? Uh, not usually. We got to go till anywhere between like 10 and 12, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, right on. Sounds like it's going to be it's going to be more of the same. Uh, on this one, there's really no need. I mean, even in a regular classroom, after that first introductory sort of lecture session, whatever, um, I would just wander around and talk to you guys anyways. So to be truthful, this the online format in this last block actually works really, really well, I think. I, uh, I hope we can keep this up for the rest of, uh, like from here on in, it'd be fantastic to be able to get you guys back out into industry earlier. Yeah, I know that we got pretty lucky when we did the Rainbird software. Yeah. That we did everything all hit the fan. We were already scheduled to remotely have control of a desktop. Yep. And I think that it was a saving grace that we got into that remote server a whole week before the whole college started trying. Yeah. Because from what I've heard, the week after we finished our Rainbird course, um, everyone fired back up at the college and it's just been an absolute shit show with uh, people just losing connection in the middle of trying to use the college's software from somewhere else. Yep. And we had a little bit of issues with that, but we had the tech guy pretty much just to ourselves. Yeah. And I think that that helped us a lot. So that's um, huge. And I, I don't, I feel like everyone learned a ton from what we were taught on the software that last course that we went through, the construction one, that was a challenge because, um, you know, that was a hands-on construction course that we ended up not having a hand on at all. So, yep. yeah, that's a hard one for sure. Yeah, we, uh, I found the same thing. We didn't really, because I had the degree guys during the shutdown, we didn't really stop. So my stuff is pretty much um, ready to go online anyway. So. We just kept going status quo and we had no problems that first week but then as you say as soon as the rest of the college picked up and really educators right across the country um that took a week off and started back up um the platforms were crashing all over the place and it's just just so much usage so even now like what we'll find it happened to marcus and i already this morning where you can hear me just fine right now we can talk to each other just fine all of a sudden, boom, the noise will, or the uh, the sound will kick off, or the screen will kick off, and I have to turn it off, reset. It only takes a second, uh, and then it fixes itself, but it's kind of interesting how uh, yeah. the system's being burdened right now. Well, I was taught, I mean, we're lucky that we're just using this Google Meets. Like, there's classes that are trying to access uh, GPS mapping. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and trying to do some of their labs, um, like through the land management programs and stuff like that. Yeah. And, right. and they also have tests once every two to four weeks. They have, you know, and so I think a lot of them after that first week went down, they all just took the credits that they could and did that thing where they sort of, you know, it's not going to affect their grades later on because of this. But, you know, I think it affected their learning for sure. So, yeah. Yeah, there's lots of uh, uh, lots of people in that same boat. A lot of educators having a, a 
having to figure things out kind of on the fly. It kind of reminds me of first year teaching. Here's the new job. Happy Friday. You start Monday. Figure it out. Yeah. So anyway, I uh, I got to hand it to Dave and Ian with some of those hands-on classes. I'm a bit uh, shielded from all that and because my courses, as you'll learn today and, and even next year, are uh, business and management related. So uh, it's much easier for me to, to uh, you know, convert, so to speak. Yeah. Well, we got 20 people online. I think we've, we we uh, we have I mean, we got all together today. Ethan's not going to make it. So that's 23. I think that's everybody. Because I've got Marcus. Yeah, I think that's everybody. Awesome. Uh, Dil Dylan Hogue isn't in, but I think he's working at his golf course this morning. Oh, is he? Okay. I'll just, if I stall, I'm not ignoring anybody. I'm just taking notes. I know, Jason, uh, one thing that Dave was doing with his class is he gave the guys the option um, if they couldn't attend the morning one that he set up at like 7 p.m., for anybody who couldn't attend the class because they were working to just kind of do a check-in so that he knew that if they had any questions and stuff, he was available. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So whether that's something you want to do or you want to work out something different with everybody, that's that's totally up to you. But that's kind of what he was doing for the guys that were working and couldn't attend the morning classes. Okay. Yeah. What I'll, what I'll go through, we might as well get started. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm basically going to be available to all of you every day. So um, we'll be live from 9 until 12.20. And then after that, I'm going to be available to you at the end of the day. If there's anybody who's um, having trouble making it to that 9 o'clock meeting, uh, that's great. I'm also going to record these sessions. If anybody wants to go back and find the, the um, link and scan through, you know, an old uh, a university trick that um, uh, several have used before as they play it back at a one and a half speed, get a get a three hour lecture done in, a, in an hour and a half. So those the, there's that option there too. But of course, if you uh, feel that anybody feels the need that they want to um, talk or connect later on in the day, whenever they're available, uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm pretty flexible. So I, I welcome whatever you guys would like to do. Um, guys, we might as well get started. It's nine oh one. Um, thanks for joining us. Thanks for uh, coming to this last block. Welcome back. Um, to get uh, to get things rolling, we haven't had a class together yet, so I think others. Oh, Dylan, how are you, man? Um, to just to get started, to give you guys a little bit of um, my background, I've been in the golf industry since I was about 14 years old. I started off in Southern Ontario, working at Elmira Golf Course, my my uh, the town where I grew up. Um, I worked there for about five years, I guess, until I realized I wanted to start moving around and. And whatnot. Uh, moved on to another golf course nearby Conestoga before uh, taking off to Guelph University and getting my uh, diploma uh, in turf. So at the time, I think it was called uh, uh, Diploma in Agriculture or something rather with a golf course major. But anyways, before, uh, just as I was graduating from Guelph, this program here at Olds College started up, the degree program that is, and uh, I joined into the first class, which would have been about 1997. Anyhow, um, before I was done uh, my degree for the work term, they invited me to be the assistant at Banff Springs, uh, just nearby here, and I spent started on with uh, Fairmont Hotels and Resorts. I worked with them for about 10 years, uh, moving from, started at Banff, uh, and then transferred over to uh, Shadow Whistler in BC. Um, from there, I took on uh, my first superintendent's job in uh, Sussex, New Brunswick, uh, and stayed there for about three years. Before moving on, uh, came back to Ontario to run uh, Lionhead Golf Course, a multi-course 36 hole in, in Milton, Ontario, just outside of Toronto. So um, in, uh, in the interim, after a year at uh, Lionhead, um, I took a job, Fairmont had a, they had a hotel in Bermuda that was uh, particularly badly beaten by a hurricane and called me to see if I would come and come back and uh, help fix it up. You can imagine every, every tree on it was a category five hurricane every tree on the property was torn up the uh, it was a gigantic 600 room hotel 
um, kind of L-shaped, and the, and the uh, hurricane picked up one side of the hotel and slammed it down on the other and then flung it back. So you can just imagine just the level of destruction. Anyway, so I went back um, to help and, um, and stayed for seven years. So anyways, uh, prior to that, I built a golf course in Milton. I was waiting for my um, uh, permit to pass and uh, got in with Club Link for a period of time to help build, uh, uh, build Glen Cairn in just outside of Milton while I was waiting for my visa to uh, get going. So anyhow, um, since then I've been, um, well, that was after seven years in Bermuda, they, they kick you out after seven years. That's the, that's the duration of your work permit. Um, so the job came up with the college and I of course took it. And the nice thing about the college is they, uh, they afford any education you want to take. So I kept doing it. It's been about 11 years now since I started at the school. Uh, and since I've done another master's in turf science from uh, Penn State and a business diploma from McMaster. Uh, just a great, uh, great opportunity to keep learning. There's always more to learn. So anyways, and here I am um, still at it. Uh, I'm on the side uh, when I'm not teaching. I also uh, am the CEO of the uh, Alberta Turf Grass Research Foundation. So when I'm not doing classes with you guys, uh, I'm usually doing delivering uh, lectures for the research foundation or performing research, which we're going to get into later on in this class. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much where I'm at uh, in terms of my experience. So you know, when um, when we're chatting about these kinds of things, I'm uh, I'm not a strawberry farmer. I've been through this before over just a, coming on to 40 years now. So. Uh, I want you to be able to be comfortable enough to ask me any question anytime um, on any topic. You know, there was, uh, I often love to have uh, a day where it's kind of a free willy. Do whatever you want, ask whatever you want, what's relevant to you uh, at the time. I'm happy to talk about just about anything. Because the truth is, if you have a question about it, uh, it's happening at work, then it's relevant. So, um, anyway, that's enough about me. Um, you guys should probably see by now the Moodle layout here is a uh, pretty self-explanatory um, right off the hop I've put uh, I put you guys all in groups. It's um, Randomly chosen from Moodle if anybody has a serious problem with that, please let me know, but I trust it's it's gonna be just fine um, We're kind of laid out here pretty standard Monday Tuesday Wednesday Thursday and so on right through uh, right down to the bottom the very last day of classes here on the 30th um, we're, it's kind of a floater day. Uh, I'm hoping that we'll take some time to learn, to prep for your internships, uh, what those look like now in light of COVID and everything else. Um, so anyways, that, I, I call that a little bit of a floater. Now, these days are also a bit flexible. Um, we're not going to jump ahead if if I don't feel that everybody's comfortable or we've really hit the mark in, term of, in terms of the theory. If we need to take another day, um, the nice thing about this format is I can yank out one of these modules if need be in order to make sure that we um, uh, complete one of these competencies. So uh, what can I say? It's dynamic, uh, as you guys have probably experienced already in some of these other classes. So um, to give, uh, you know, I like to give you a little bit of a piece here in terms of um, what to expect. Um, this, day, this daily Google Meet, again, 9 until 1220, I'm going to be um, available live. Uh, what I typically do is I'll turn off my microphone and turn a little bit of music on um, so you guys know that I'm still here. Uh, so you're welcome to use the chat box, reach out to me directly. I can hear you on the other end, so uh, don't feel like I'm gone. Um, the uh, daily expectation for the class here is uh, essentially re read all these Moodle books. You can see your day one. This one doesn't really count, but what I would, uh, what I would typically ask you guys to do is read through module A1, A2, A3, and when class begins, um, start of the day, you'd be fairly familiar with um, what the topic of conversation is going to be and allow us to jump right into the uh, activity with, with uh, uh, only a, a small amount of lead time. Uh, what you'll find is uh, typically I'll have a brief presentation here every day. I'll give you one today um, because I realize that most of you haven't read um, the uh, books at all. The lesson is simply to uh, kind of summarize, give you the Coles notes of what's in those books. So I might, I don't always give that to you, but I certainly will today. Um, after we do our little um, catch up, um, we'll go over any quizzes. 
We'll review any assignments that uh, you guys worked on the day before. Make sure everybody's on track um, and answer those up before getting right into uh, usually an activity each day and an assignment each day. Now, as you review through here, you'll see it's quite balanced. Um, there's, I would say, about 60% individual work with about 40% uh, group work. So you'll, uh, and some of the some of the assignments and activities are blended. So it has, um, it has a, uh, I got a message here from, to open up the lesson plan, absolutely, sorry about that. No, Jason, it was, it was the, um, I needed to request access. It, it wasn't open, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Typically, I, I was, uh, um, typically I just use that as a, as my own reference, but you're welcome to look at it. There's nothing um, um, secretive about what we're doing here. Uh, so basically moving on here, you can see what we're up against. We'll review the quiz every day. We'll review any, review any assignments every day. Um, perhaps I'll have a presentation on a daily topic if necessary, and then we'll chat over uh, individual or group work. Um, I'll ask you to take a quiz every day on the topic of, uh, of the day, and then again, read again for tomorrow. So that's pretty much uh, everything uh, in terms of housekeeping that I think we need to take care of. Uh, I also recognize that you guys are in various um, stages of work or and otherwise. So if you have your if you have a problem, if you've missed a quiz or you've missed an assignment, hopefully not so much with group work. But uh, if you do happen to miss an assignment, I'd much rather extend it than give you zero on it. So just let me know. Um, everything's due um, every day by midnight. So do your best. Let me give me as good of a heads up as you can. Um, generally request an extension before the due date and not after would be ideal. So moving on here, guys, does anybody have any questions? Open the chat box here. If anybody's got anything to, to that they're unsure on. Okay, well, what we're gonna talk about today, guys, is to kind of get this started. Um, I'd like to give you an overview, just a, you know, the name Evaluating Professional Standards, as you probably know, there's lots of courses that, that don't really tell the whole tale just in a single statement or a single line. Um, you know, the relevancy of, of this course to me is helping you guys understand um, and, and really start scratching the surface of what it's going to take to become a golf course manager. You know, as a diploma student, you can you guys can certainly expect to see assistance jobs in your near future. Some of you will find yourselves in superintendent's jobs if you're not already. Uh, and it's important to know that, you know, very few superintendents lose their jobs because they don't know how to grow grass. That's the easy part. It's everything else that's involved. And, and to put this in perspective, your labor costs, the staff, the people that you hire, Cost is, is equivalent to about 65 to 70% of your total operational costs. So when uh, we look at a national average of um, the kind of money that you guys are going to spend on behalf of your clubs every year, to the tune of about $820,000 to $840,000 a year, 65 to 70% of that is going to be labor. Um, that's the biggest, most important part. Um, for superintendents that lose their jobs, that's usually what they do, what they mismanage. They're unable to acquire the right people, keep the right uh, people, or uh, keep themselves out of trouble in terms of liability. So what we're going to, uh, what this course really does do is it leads into, as you imagine, uh, as you probably gathered, my specialty here is, is business and operations. So um, I teach TRF 3000, uh, which is the agronomic calendar next year. Uh, in the degree level and 4,200, which is the business of golf. Um, a lot of students use this course uh, to leverage into their applied degree, their summer work. So uh, it is a management level sort of stuff and it definitely does lead into next year's work. So um, if you ever question the, uh, the relevancy of what we're doing, please don't hesitate to, to um, speak up and, and uh, clarify what we're talking about. So what this, what this course is going to help you guys do is, and this is the first one that we're going to talk about is, um, I've got a little point down here. How many people do you hire? 
And a lot of the activities, a lot of the assignments and the modules that I put together in this course were based on my own experience coming into a new superintendent's job at the kind of course that you guys should expect to get to. You know, um, you have to be honest with yourself. Uh, nobody coming out of a diploma after two years of turf education is going to walk in to Prudis Greens or Glencoe or Banff Springs or the Petroleum Club and expect to be superintendent. That's just the reality of the thing is you're going to be probably starting out at a smaller 18 hole course and having to establish the kind of protocols and plans that uh, simply aren't in place so far. Uh, this was exactly the same thing that happened to me when I took on uh, my first superintendent's job. Uh, there was no uh, employee standard, standards. There was no um, hiring policy. There was no guest expectation. There was no mission statement. There was there was essentially, um, uh, listen, you figure it out. You know, I'd ask, well, how fast do you need your greens? Well, that's up to you. Well, how many times do you want us to mow the fairways every week? Well, that's up to you. Um, without any uh, real breakdown of maintenance standards or the costs associated, uh, they're all part of the job of how, he, how to be a, a good superintendent. Um, and in my presentation, I'll, I'll clarify that a little bit more on uh, what kind of impact that can have. Um, some of the other things that we're going to talk about in this class are what are the goals of the club and how does that affect me in terms of work? You know, when I think about what I want to do in the industry or what we need to do as, as an industry, as the next generation of superintendents, is be better. Um, if if I could um, scan the crowd here, um, how many of you, and, and this will be the short list for the chat box, if you're working 40 hours a week, um, please let me know who you are. And I, I'm guessing that it's going to be less than 22 people. Anybody in the chat box uh, in the class here working 40 hours a week or less? Uh, when COVID's not around, more than 40 for sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's the, the standard. In, I am, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I'm working, yeah. Over 40. Yeah. I, I imagine most of you are working uh, over 40. The, the norm, on average, if you, if you look at the golf course superintendent survey, uh, the majority of people out on the uh, golf course, people in your roles, leadership roles, are working between 60 and 70 hours every week. That's kind of the standard. Now... They call it the standard, but that's not right either. And the, this is where I want to kind of improve ourselves as superintendents, improve our industry, because that's definitely got to stop. If you understand the uh, governance structure of clubs, how they make their money and where they make their money, you might look at that a little differently too. So we're going to chat a little bit about uh, governance and goals of the club. And this is, it kind of filters into mission statements here. And I, and I know that you'll initially want to roll your eyes, but after you see this, uh, after we break this all down, I think it'll make a lot more sense to you. And you'll look at those 60, 70 hours a week and think it completely differently. We shouldn't be sacrificing our own, uh, our own uh, family time, our own um, social time uh, by working our asses off for an owner who all they're really doing is making more money off of us. So when somebody said, and we hear this a lot, uh, we just don't have the money for this right now. Well, do you really not have the money or do the owners, are they just trying to meet their 5% return? So anyways, uh, I'll take you into a little bit of a, a business side uh, view of golf course ownership that I don't think a lot of um, uh, super tense have experience in, and uh, I can promise you that very few clubs uh, or very few uh, uh, turf programs educate you about this. They'll teach you how to grow grass, and I'm hoping to take you a little bit further. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about um, policy writing, and I again, I don't want you to roll your eyes because really what it means is uh, how can I legally hire somebody and how can I fire somebody? How do I avoid somebody standing at the end of my desk at the end of the day saying, why does Jimmy make more than me when we do the same jobs? And uh, uh, how to avoid the legality side of it, how to look at um, staff with a very objective point of view as, a very, as opposed to a subjective point of view. Um, now that marijuana is legal amongst all these other things with our next generation of employees, you've got to be able to know what your rights are and what you can and cannot do with your staff. Um, anyway, policies are uh, perfect. 
in that regard uh, to help cover your uh, tail, so to speak. And last but not least, how this all sums up, uh, what we're going to do, the final project in this class is uh, we're going to produce an employee handbook and not in the traditional sense. Um, I'm sure there's lots of you who have started jobs where they've handed you this massive three ring binder and, so, and say, read this, learn it. Um, it's a requirement of employment. And uh, speaking of my own experience, that was the first thing that went in my locker and never moved for the duration of my employment there. So we're, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take those five components of the lesson plan, if you're following, that I just explained and put them into a uh, web page. And the web page is not going to go away. Uh, hopefully, some of you have even embarked on this already. But um, the web page is a way to collect all the um, all these activities, all the assignments that we're going to do over the next two weeks, and put them all together. Everything in this class is going to build to that final assignment. So your uh, the final assignment, which is your employee handbook, has about nine components. And uh, conveniently enough, we've got nine components to put in it that we're going to cover each day. So the uh, the final assignment is, should not be too intimidating to you. We're going to be working through them uh, every single day. The, every day we, we uh, uh, have a class, the closer we get to the finish. So really, by the time we get to that final assignment, all you're really doing is fine-tuning. So nothing too, um, shouldn't be too uh, intimidating. Um, any questions so far, guys, about uh, what we're what we're up to in the course as far as uh, what we need to do, the expectation? Uh, I think that was that was really great. Uh, it outlined what we're doing pretty well. Cool. Um, you guys should all know too that uh, this is college. I don't take attendance. If uh, you're in your groups, you're accountable to each other. Right. If you can't be in class or you're working, you're unable to, you need to coordinate this with your team to make sure that you can get stuff done. Um, a lot of the, when you dig into some of these assignments, you're going to see that there's there's individual portions in it um, that I'm asking you to just be accountable for. If, uh, for example, they'll, you'll have a group assignment that has five components in it, and I'll have each one of you need to choose, pick, horse trade, whatever you want to call it, um, pick one of those components and just put your name beside it. Say, hey, this is the one I did. That's the individual portion. The The group um, portion of these assignments is the coordination of all that. I don't want you to take um, five different pieces and chuck them in a bowl and shake them about and then just submit it. It needs, you know, part of uh, a fluid assignment, um, something that's coherent, means that you're sharing all your stuff together and you're talking it through and you're saying, yeah, this fits right here. This fits better there. Let's move it around. That's the that's the group work that I'm uh, trying to get out of you to show that you're working together um, while at the same time you can still do your own sort of uh, stuff. So anyway, if uh, we'll address any questions that you might have um, uh, as they arise, but hopefully it's fairly clear. Um, on that note, whoever's in group A, uh, William, Jacob, Jordan, and Nolan, uh, John's wife went into labor this morning, and he is at the Red Deer Hospital having a child, so he's not, in, he's not in class this morning, so I thought that was pretty cool, and he just messaged me and told me to let uh, you guys know that that's why he's not in class. Hey, right on. That's great. Yeah, there's, hey, I'm, uh, what a great reason to be, uh, to be out of class. That's fantastic. Thanks for letting us know, Dan. Awesome. Well, hey, get a get. Uh, you know, Jordan's going to want to take some time um, to take care of that sort of business and get to know his new family member. Um, I can reach out to him too and um, see what we can't work out. Uh, pretty. Yeah, that, that's actually John. John oh, McLean. Sorry, I said whoever I said this. Anyway. Um, I'll reach out to him and make sure that we can make uh, some uh, adjustments here. He's obviously going to be want to want to get to know his uh, his son or daughter there, and, and we'll make accommodations. Same with everybody on the on the uh, on the wire here. Um, life tends to happen, and uh, things like that certainly take priority. Um, and I totally totally respect that. So just let just gotta let me know what's going on. Awesome. Well, moving on, guys, uh, before uh, before I jump right into the lesson for today, 
Um, Marcus has left something for us here. This is a COVID supplementary form. Um, it's just, as you know, COVID changes things day to day. You've already done a survey for him. This is uh, one extra question that they had to ask that he's hoping you guys can fill it out. Um, if you don't mind, it only takes, it takes about two seconds. You can see um, name, what year you're enrolled in and what date. If you could take care of that right now for, for uh, Marcus, I know he would sure appreciate it. So, um, and then we'll uh, get going. And I can dig right into the uh, presentation for today. Jason, uh, just so you know, my wife is uh, due in two weeks as well. So I'll be uh, possibly having to dip out here soon. Hey, congratulations, Evan. That's fantastic. Thanks. Okay, we'll uh, we'll we'll roll with it as it uh, as we need to. No big deal. We'll figure something out. That, uh, as I mentioned, family takes priority one hundred percent of the time. And uh, you know, it's it's funny that we're talking about um, you know babies and families in this class because honestly, it's uh, at this point in your lives couldn't be more relevant. So I'm really happy to uh, to uh, accommodate you guys. So. To get to get into the uh, lecture for today, guys, we're going to talk about mission statements uh, as they pertain to uh, course maintenance. Um, as I kind of briefly alluded to in the uh, in the earlier bit, um, it's very hard for a new superintendent that doesn't have any guiding principles to make the kinds of decisions um, uh, that need to be made for the betterment of the golf course. And I'll I'll share this example with you just to kind of frame this up a little bit. There's two different golf courses side to side. One very uh, obvious you guys uh, recognize, um, but the two mission statements of the two clubs uh, are very, very similar. From a superintendent standpoint, um, you know, it'd be very difficult to try to articulate that into a guiding statement for a super. And, and when I say guiding statement, um, can anybody can anybody on the phone here and, or, or online, um, Give me an idea what you think that means in terms of in what way is a mission statement a guiding statement for the superintendent uh it maybe sets the bar that you want to reach when it comes to how you're going to maintain your course yeah that's perfect that's a perfect uh, way to explain it darren um you know every single one of you guys can grow grass on the side of your car. It's been two years of turf training. You can you can do just about anything with a, a, a blade of grass. Um, and in my experience, all of you want to go out there and produce Augusta every single day. But you can't, without a, a, a some kind of benchmark from your club, it's hard for you to figure out, well, how far to Augusta can we, should we really take this? And it's very easy to blow the bank um, on that on your way there uh usually what happens is you uh you over deliver the club can't afford it and uh you either come under fire or lose your job altogether the here's the example of these two different courses this one club is just out of alberta here the best possible in golf experience for the members and guests offering first class customer service and superior playing conditions is very very similar to that of pebble beach once in a lifetime experience every time so as a superintendent at either place, it'll be very hard for you to decide, huh, do I buy the $2,200 pin flags or should I be buying the $200 pin flags? Our mission statement is exactly the same. We want to provide first-class customer experience. And, and what I'm trying to get at is first-class customer experience, to me, says $2,200 pin flags. A once-in-a-lifetime experience every time says $2,200 uh, pin flags. But you start buying pin flags for that club on the left, you'll be broke and fired before uh, you get the course set. So there has to be some vocabulary, some dialogue between the superintendent and the ownership or governance model to be able to really hash that out. And this is for your own good. You've got to have these discussions to figure out uh, what they're able to afford. So 
what I'm what we're going to embark on here is how the mission statement is going to guide you guys. How you can usually refer back to that mission statement and help it to help that statement um, guide you in making the kinds of decisions. For instance, do we mow the rough five days a week or seven days a week or is three days okay? So this is this is something that uh, I've been trying to, uh, or I have been rolling out to uh, superintendents right across the country for uh, the last well close to ten years now. Um, you know, having been at eight different golf courses and seen this so many times, uh, it's the biggest thing that I found was lacking from a management standpoint. And I've been calling it the the shopping list. You know, interestingly enough, um, you know, all these courses blend into one another. You're uh, the course that you that I take uh, or I teach you guys in uh, third year, the agronomic counter or TRF three thousand. The final project is um, is I ask you to produce an operating budget and then cut ten percent of it um, as the as the finalist. You can't do that unless you've had you have a, a level of expectation defined already. And I'm calling it the core standards list or the shopping list. You may call it something else. But what it is, is a breakdown of um, all the items that your mission statement implies that you need to do every single day to um, present your golf course to its membership. And of course, they're different. Everybody has different ones. You can't take the level of expectation at the Calgary Golf and Country Club and compare it to the Old Silence. You know, they're two very different um, clubs, but they also have two very different clients. You know, um, the Calgary Golf Club with a $60,000 initiation fee, there's a reason why it doesn't compete with um, Old Thailand's. It doesn't mean that they're too, the one course is any better than the next, but it means they have different levels of expectation and different clients. So it's not wrong. It's not a comparison between what's better um, than one course or the next. They're just different. So this is what we're going to try to break out. Um, what the shopping list does is, is what I'm, and I'm, what I'll ask you guys to do is produce that, um, list of core standards based on the mission of your club and the missions being is it to to provide an affordable uh, family friendly golf course or is it to be the best of the best of the best um, your shopping list changes and when in my perspective um, until you've got that shopping list broken down and you know what the core standards for the club are uh, then you can start breaking down well how long does it take to do those things Again, every course is different. Um, when you look at a place like Glencoe with 160 bunkers, it's a lot different than um, Carstairs Golf Club that has 30. You know, so your the course standards have different requirements. Um, to have an expectation from a uh, member that all bunkers are going to be raked every day, well, at Carstairs you probably only need two people. At um, at Glencoe, you need a team of 12 every single day. So your costs are relative. Sorry, I keep bumping my microphone. It probably doesn't sound so good. Um, anyway, it's absolutely crucial in addressing uh, budget cuts and gives you uh, an opportunity to associate hours with expenses. So this is what one of the things I'm going to get you guys to do in your uh, group work is establish, and, and not necessarily today, but in the days ahead, um, produce a core standard for every single um, um, category of the golf course not every task but every category you know we've got greens we've got tees we've got bunkers we've got fairways we've got roughs gardens and whatnot um each one has an umbrella sort of view of or or expectation of what those um surfaces are supposed to present themselves as every day you know an example of a greens core standard this is remember this is the overarching uh, view of that playing surface your core standard statement would be greens need to be blemish-free, consistent, and receptive. Right? That's the expectation by the membership, by your owners, regardless of what governance that you're in. Um, in this case, this means you've got to do a number of different things in order to achieve that, to uphold your um, requirements as a superintendent. This is what they're, uh, they've hired you for and the, what they're going to measure you by. Um, are your greens blemish free? Are they consistent? Are they receptive? Well, in order to be blemish free, you got to spend money on fungicides and fertilizers. To be consistent, you got to spend money on aeration, vertical mowing, uh, maintenance, sharpening, um, mechanics to take care of, and everything else. Um, to be receptive, sorry, I've overlapped here, but aeration, you've got to make sure that they're 
uh, soft enough that your needle neither t needle tining or spiking or otherwise. Um, you got to set the golf course up every day to make sure that they're playing consistently and fresh. So there's there's an example of a shopping list when it comes to itemizing that core standard. Now to to put this in perspective, so I am a I'm your general manager, and I say, uh, okay, Willie, you need to uh, we need to cut our operating budget. I want you to reduce costs by ten percent. Now. With this, and I, I call this the shopping list. If this is your shopping list, and you have to cut ten percent from this shopping list, now you have an itemized piece in order to go back to the general manager and say, "Okay, well, here's here's our here's our deal. Um, you want us to cut ten percent? Um, we will we'll stop. Maybe we'll, we won't set up the course every day. Maybe we won't do ball marks every day. Maybe we won't change pins every day. We'll cut that from two hundred fifty dollars a week down to a." A buck twenty-five, uh, and you go back to the GM and you say, "Well, that's what what we'll do." What do you think? Um, and they might say, "Oh, well, we can't really not change the pins every day." It's great. Okay, let's keep moving down the list. Aeration or vertical mowing? Well, you know, we could reduce uh, all our cultural practices, and uh, we could reduce that by sixty, seventy dollars a week. That would help get us towards the bottom line. But again, now they won't be as receptive. So, and here's here's the clincher. You're making decisions based on what your owners or um, board of directors are asking you to do, cut 10%. But as you do that, if you're, if you're going to uh, meet their requirements, now you're not hitting the core standard anymore, and now your job is at risk. What's stopping them? When they tell you to cut half of your operating costs, and you go back middle of the summer in July, and they say, you know what, the Greens have got disease on them. They're not consistent. They're not receptive. You're a terrible superintendent, and you're fired. You, you don't have anything to fall back on to say, hey, man, I did this for you. Without a core standard list, without a breakdown of a shopping list of what kinds of things we spend our money on doing every week uh, or every month or every year, you really don't have any defense of those unethical uh, owners or uh, boards to come back and relieve you. Um, and unfortunately, what ends up happening is um, – you know, to, again, we're talking about improving the industry here. Um, budget cuts are inevitable. And even this year, especially with COVID, we can all expect it. Um, your boss is going to come down and say, hey, we've got to cut 30% off of our operating budget, maybe more. So what you're going to do is you're going to lay people off because that's the highest component of, of um, your labor costs. Uh, but you're not going to have it itemized. So what ends up happening is you as the salaried labor force end up working harder and harder and harder, 60, 70, 80 hour statistic you're making your way up to and you're not adjusting the maintenance standards. So unfortunately it's uh, the whole budget cut ends up falling on your shoulders and you've sacrificed your own family for to do it. And uh, so anyways, I guess it's, it's, a, it's a long drawn out sort of definition of why we're doing this, but. I think it's crucially important that you guys see the relevancy of this, um, how it, it really is a, a big reason why our, why our industry is uh, forcing us to work these ridiculous hours and, and honestly contributing to this, the highest divorce statistic um, uh, around. So let's fix it. Similar example with the course setup standard. There's an example of um, a course standard for course setup. You've got all of these components Every time when, when you're asked to cut budgets, those are going to be affected. It shouldn't fall on your shoulders as a salaried employee to pick up the slack when you lay people off. Something's got to give. And the, without having a list of these core standards to be able to say to those owners, this is what's going to happen before it happens, um, you're setting yourself up for failure. So here's an example of um, what happens when, another example, what happens when you don't have core standards lists uh, clearly defined. And he here's a question to the crew. Uh, on, in the chat box there, how many of you guys, just a yay or nay, um, feel that your uh, capital equipment is a little less than um, acceptable at this point? How many of you guy guys have been dreaming of uh, new equipment and uh, just don't seem to have the money or never seem to get it or otherwise? You can chat or you can... Um, 
you can th throw a comment out there. Yes, we have great equipment. No, we never do. Well, we're about not quite 50-50. We've got some with with uh, good equipment in the shop, some with not so much. Uh, did you? If you just said shop, there's two guys here that don't even have one of those. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, that would be Dylan and Dylan and Ken. Uh, I don't know hey, about no. their equipment, but they don't have a shop. <laughs> oh dear. Hey, no. Where are you keeping your equipment? Tent. A compound. No, I think we're. Let's see if Ken's here. I don't see him on there. Anyway, my uh, I guess I'll get to the. Ready, Jason. <laughs> Sorry, it's okay. Everybody's got their microphones muted. It's all good. The uh, what ends up happening is, and and I'll give you the lowdown. Let's say um, you don't have a set of standards, and and I'll use um, fairway mowing as an example. Let's say you don't have a uh, um, set standards, so you decide to mow fairways five days a week. Well, your club spends more money on maintenance, repairs, the life expectancy drops. You spend more on fuel. Um, if your club, if you're at, if your membership or your owners don't haven't requested that level of um, maintenance, and you're providing it, then you're spending too much money. It's not that you do or don't know what you're doing you haven't had that conversation with your owners to decide um, what do you want so what ends up happening is uh, a lot of times when when standards aren't in place and consumer tenants are forced to make their own decisions uh, it ends up sacrificing um, their capital um, costs or sinking funds rather uh, every single um, golf course across the nation on a national average spend seventy two thousand dollars a year on equipment and I don't, and I don't mean every year, but um, it accrues year over year. The fairway more is about eighty-four grand now. Um, there's no question that um, everything depreciates, and uh, we have to mow grass to keep our courses uh, operational. So, as you burn through, decide arbitrarily to mow those fairways five days a week, you're reducing the lifespan of that fairway more. So it comes to some surprise without standards or expectations uh, when you go to the owners and say hey I need a new fairway mower this year or next year and you know the eyeballs uh, open wide it's like, oh, geez, we don't have the money uh, and do, can anybody tell me what happens when you as a superintendent go to your general manager or owners and say hey I knew I need a new fairway mower if it's a if it's a semi-private club what happens to the membership uh they lose their minds <laughs> <laughs> definitely could you be anyone be more specific anybody a member of a golf course would their memberships not go up a bit yeah or their taxes yeah. right. kendon's bang on membership costs go up or uh in the case of um an equity structure you get assessed we've all heard that uh, swear word before so this is this is uh, this happened to me when I got into New Brunswick. Uh, this was exactly what the case was. They didn't have a sinking fund. They didn't uh, have a capital replacement plan rep uh, in place. Uh, when I went in there, there was the place was held together with duct tape and zip ties. And uh, I simply said, "Listen, there's there's no front rotary mower out here. That's a death trap. Uh, I think it's I cannot uh, in good." Um, judgment send one of your staff members out in one of those things to to put this in perspective this was a mower that I was trained on when I was 14 years old and this was being used on a daily basis and this was in 2000 so it was uh, you can just imagine what this thing was it was it was a bloody death trap anyway uh, when I go to the owners and say listen uh, we need to I need $35,000 like yesterday. Um, they said, oh, we, we don't have it. And I said, well, I, we can't mow grass around our on our hillsides and around our trees without it. So I became instantly the least popular person at the club. And it was uh, 
I thought, here I am in my first year, I'm risking my employment right off the bat. But it was because, um, and nobody ever leaves a job because of, of it's in a good situation. But uh, so I had to propose a new capital uh, replacement program. I had to assess the members that hadn't been, had their dues increased in over 10 years um, to the tune of about 20%. Uh, just year over year. So um, just to catch up with what wasn't happening in the past and in order to keep the operation alive. So um, from from your side of the desk, that's what you can expect. But you should be prepared um, to have these discussions. You know, when you don't have a sinking fund or you don't have uh, money set aside every year for equipment replacement, um, your repair bills increase, your equipment repair costs skyrocket. You know, and right across the board, clubs spending any more than about 25 grand a year on equipment repairs means their uh, equipment replacement um, uh, fund is not working correctly, or they've been um, or they've been deferred too many years. Of course, your equipment uh, conditions decline. You know, when you're when you're dealing with a 15 or 20 year old Greensmore, you can't always count on it to start every day. So there's an expectation that you're being held accountable to. The greens have to be mowed and receptive and consistent every day. But the capital, um, without capital, you're kind of risking your own employment, even though that's not your fault. Uh, how can you be held accountable for something that is has been beyond your control for however many years? So um, not to mention, um, we all have mechanics that might drink uh, a little more than they should, at least in my experience, they certainly did. Uh, when, you keep, uh, when you keep them running old, crappy equipment, um, that tends to accentuate the problem. Now, some, something else in terms of, of course, standards that you guys have to consider is labor costs. Um, you know, to, to compare the cost of equipment flatly, excuse me, between Triplex and Walker, for instance, is kind of a moot point. Triplex is about 35 grand a year, and the Walkers are anywhere between seven and 10, but you also need a golf cart, you also need trailers and all that sort of stuff. The, the equipment, the capital part of it is really not the big number. It's always labor. I mentioned before, labor's 65 to 70 percent of your total operating costs. So anytime that you can reduce labor, you're going to reduce money. Now, as a superintendent, if you haven't established the expectation of your owners or your players membership, uh, you might be um, you might consider say, hey, walk owners provide every single service is much more consistent. It's easier for or, or better quality conditions. I think the whole compaction issue is, is a moot point anymore. But anyway, your arbitrary decision as a superintendent to walk mow your greens is costing your club about 20 grand a year. So when the club says, and here we are in COVID where all this comes dramatically relevant. Um, when the club says, hey, you've, you've got to cut 60 grand off of your operating budget in order for us to survive, what can you do? Uh, these are the kinds of things that you have to decide and have the discussion, core standards-wise. Do we really need to use walkers or can we use uh, triplexes? Here's another example uh, from Fairways. And this is probably the one most dramatic one that I've uh, come across over the years. Um, on the left there, you see British Open style, salt and pepper, however you want to call it, down one side of the fairway, up the other. Um, as opposed to on the right hand side, a, a really elaborate cross answering. I mean, that's an exaggerated example, of course. But uh, whenever you're burning in those fairway lines and putting in those kinds of stripes, uh, it costs money, right? It takes twice as much time. So the simple math is uh, your decision as a superintendent, you may like the cross etching look. You might look uh, at that as, hey, that, that looks pro. Um, but the fact is, you're costing your club about 8,500 bucks. Um, in just in hours a year just and that's just an that's a subjective opinion of what you think looks better in actual fact this image on the left here that might be your member preference so where this is where the discussion has to happen between your ownership and your superintendent to say what are what are the expectations of the club because they all affect the bottom line now here's a Here's a uh, to take this even a little bit further. You know, we're paying 84, 85 grand for one of these fairway mowers right now. And your decision here on the right hand side to cross hatch those fairways, you're reducing the effective life of that um, fairway mower to just 10 years, as opposed to um, if we were going to go um, British Open style, you'd almost double that. You know, you'd certainly, 
and and realistically we're probably not going to mow fairways with the same unit for 20 years but the depreciation the value of that unit after 10 years is double that of what um, your unit would be on this other example so your decision arbitrary or not subjective or otherwise have a huge impact on uh, what your club is spending on an annual basis and if you don't have a set of core standards broken out um, I think you're wasting your money so basically what your mission statement is supposed to do is should clarify the goals of the club and the purpose of the club your assignment today I'm gonna to ask you to do is look into your own mission statements of your club and and see if it really does give you that guiding light does it say inequivocally yes we need to uh, double cut and roll our greens every single day or does it mean no oh, you know what one times a day with a triplex is plenty uh, do we do we uh, uh, mow twice a day once a day the mission statement should be a, uh, a reference for you as a superintendent to say and I've done this before I had our I had our mission statement for our club framed right above my office desk and every time I would look at a purchase whether it was foliar fertilizers or um, another load of top dressing sand or uh, a, a new ball washer I would look at that mission statement and say is this what our members really want is this does this meet the direction of the club is this going to help us be profitable because that's what you're being measured of ultimately can you help the club um, make a dollar save a dollar uh, especially in this climate when uh, very few clubs are making money most of which are uh, going under we're still losing about 14 clubs a year to foreclosure because they can't manage their costs it's the biggest thing we have on our plate right now uh, and especially with uh, COVID um, I hope to prepare you guys better than the average superintendent out there that has no way of how to respond to this so um, today's task now you've got two things that I'm gonna ask you guys to do today uh, one being your own individual um, assignment I want you to evaluate your own club's mission statement does it imply a certain level of maintenance necessary does it suggest your club is affordable versus superior and what does that ex, uh, superior um, suggest if and I'll use this example you know uh, I use Glencoe and Pritis a lot because honestly they're the they're the premier clubs in Alberta and we're all uh, comfortable and, and familiar with Alberta so I'll use those uh, regularly but if for a, for a club like Glencoe, we're there to provide a superior experience, exceptional experience every time. That does imply to uh, at, at several levels, a superior everything, superior staffing, superior services, superior amendments. You know, um, you can't be uh, associating those kinds of superior or exceptional costs to a club that's geared to family friendly or um, enjoyable golf rounds. Um, Ravencrest, one of my students in the degree uh, 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 program used his mission statement from Ravencrest, which was the most relaxed, laid back club in the province of Alberta. That doesn't suggest, um, you know, 100 staff a year maintaining it. Um, with, uh, you know, when I worked at Banff Springs there for a while and our staffing levels were, and, and their guest experience uh, was uh, over the top. Um, they want to make, create enjoyable experiences every single time. Uh, memorable experiences, I think, was their hashtag. Um, we had a staff of 50 and they were charging 250 bucks a round. Um, we did everything in our power to make every uh, uh, guest have a memorable experience in that reflected the mission statement so I'll ask you does yours reflect yours when when your mission statement at your club says we want to provide the best possible conditions in all the golf courses in Alberta but your owners say yeah uh, you know you'll stick to about six people seven people for staffing this year does that really give you a guiding light probably not um, to give you a little bit of help here um, the CGSA has a compensation survey that's that's delivered every year 2017 was the last one and gives you a, a pretty good breakdown of of um, of what the expectation is in terms of averages and staffing and labor and all that sort of stuff uh, have you guys seen that thing yet anybody have access to uh, um, that list or that document 
Uh, I haven't read it yet personally. No. Nope. Okay. If if you think it'll be useful, I'd be happy to share it with you. The industry average of staff is about 15 uh, full-time people and three part-timers per year. That's an average golf course, $824,000 a year. That's average. So that might help you break down your mission statement a little bit more. And I want you to look and see if your green fees also reflect a level of maintenance that's implied with that mission statement as well. So I really want you to try to uh, align your mission statement with your club. And if you don't have one, I want you to create one. Okay, we're going to produce our own uh, course standards in this class. So this is as far as I did allude to the the um, the final project, the big project at the end of this class. Um, we have uh, what I'm asking you to do is produce an, a digital employee handbook in the form of a web page. Uh, it's going to include all kinds of things. Today's first is the cover page and the mission statement. So part of your assignment today, and I'll get out of here and go back to the course. This is so this is your um, individual work that you'll have that I'm asking you to do today. We're slow on the uptake. Uh, this is the I want you to quote your own mission statement, talk about staffing, talk about fees and revenues, and then summarize it. That's a 10 point uh, assignment. You can see my marketing scheme down here. And you submit everything um, Google Docs wise. The second piece, and this is kind of a pass or fail, this is nothing um, um, to be uh, too concerned about, but you need to start the framework today. And that is I want you to look at, and you can do this as groups and decide on something that you all prefer, but I want you guys to pick a web page platform for your employee manual. Uh, some of the things that uh, you might want to consider here is sign off. We're going to produce a whole bunch of policies. Um, for instance, if you're going to ask your staff to wear hard hats, you have to be able to prove that they read your policy on hard hats or harassment or otherwise, and you have to be able to um, prove it. How do you know that they read it? How do you know that they um, have uh, agreed to it? And we'll get into this later on, but um, it's all about liability. If, if you have a uh, harassment policy that says, hey, we have zero tolerance, you harass another employee, you're fired. Um, if they don't have, if you if they go to a, if you fire them, and they go to a labor lawyer, and you haven't had uh, been very clear about your policies and what the um, standards of employment are, then you're liable as a superintendent. Then you're not doing your job. So keep that in mind. Each one of these policies, whether it's each policy gets signed off or one um, sign off for the entire thing, um, give that a little bit of thought in terms of how your web page is going to read. Uh, I also want you to think about, um, you know, with core standards, we have training, we have best management practices that go along with it. And I'll go back to our um, our uh, daily routine here. We talked right here on Wednesday about core standards and best management practices. This is the training component of your uh, handbook. So this is where I'm going to get you guys to draw a pull in training pieces, and I've provided some in the resources that you can most definitely use if they suit you, if you you know, if you know, believe in them. Um, but think about that web page as a, um, that shell, that container for all your training components. You can have a chapter or a tab on that web page that has, this is how we mow greens. This is how we um, perform T setup. This is how we move blocks, and this is how we move fairways. So think about that um, today. I'd like you to pick a uh, as your assignments for today. Analyze your mission statement, and then choose a web page platform for your employee handbook. And there should be a place for you to um, submit that. It doesn't look like we're going to have a look at that. Anyway, does anybody have any questions about uh, what is being asked of you today as far as assignments go? Um, do you have any recommendations as to what kind of platforms worked for groups in the past? Like, um, I know there's probably some you have to pay for, some that are free. Um, yeah. But uh, would would something like a uh, a uh, Google Sites work for this? Or yep, absolutely, absolutely. We, uh, you know, I'm always going to try to convince you guys to take uh, the degree and everything that we do in this diploma blends kind of ladders into this degree. Um, Google Sites has been the web page of choice 
for the majority of our DFS students. Um, our uh, Andrea Nix is the instructor for 399, which is, goes over your student learning plan. And that's one that she's uh, been promoting. We've had a few students go to use the Wix um, as an example. Uh, WordPress, I've had some students do WordPress, but it's not really my favorite. Doesn't, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to grade you on the, um, how colorful your website is, but it does have to be functional in terms of, um, it's gotta be functional for your staff, and it's gotta be something that you can use once you get out into the field. It should be easily uh, adjustable, um, something that you can um, um, change as you change jobs or leave it with your club um, and start over. But again, you know, this, this employee handbook was one of the things that I didn't have when I started. Uh, you know, after, after all the education I got and became a superintendent, I found myself at the club and they didn't have these core standards. We didn't have an employee handbook. And I spent the whole first year, you know, all the overtime you can think of, trying to put this together um, because it, I couldn't do it without, um, I still had to hire people. I couldn't do it without having standards and, and expectations. I couldn't set my budget without having a core standard set up. And it was, uh, boy, I, I feel like I lost 10 years of my life in that first year trying to do exactly what we're setting out to do in this class. So I wanted you to, to really, um, understand uh, how important this is um, in terms of what you can expect when you get out of here, and what I think you're really, really going to use and refer to in the future. Um, a lot of my DFS students use this um, employee handbook and leverage it into their own uh, clubs. So this is this is one of those things, if you look ahead uh, and if you're planning on coming back next year, this can save you a ton of time and um, really help in your um, applied degree learning goal. So yeah, Wix, Google Sites uh, was a common one that they're pushing it at in third and fourth year. Um, and WordPress was another one. I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but again, it's totally up to you guys. Um, discuss with one another. See what your thoughts are. Share some ideas. Um, have a look at a few sites. I prefer you find something uh, free, uh, but I don't think they're that expensive to set up if you really want to anyway. Um, so anyway, I would I would urge you to go to Google Sites just because it is free, and I know I, I'm I'm familiar with it anyway. Um, any other questions, guys, from the floor? Uh, yeah, so is it like each group is doing a website, or is it like everyone is doing an individual website? All the all the activity, like you see these the governance systems, the score standards sheet, the best manager practices, and etiquette and ethics. See, the beauty of this class is there a lot of them are going to be transferable. You know, the same rule that you might have at your uh, course in terms of um, how to treat your other employees, when to show up, how to address time off and overtime and lateness and all that sort of stuff. Those policies and procedures are going to be transferable to everybody. So you're going to produce them in groups. For the final assignment, you're going to transfer all those group components into your own web page, so you have something uh, of your own to walk away with. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, any other questions from the floor? What were uh, the just the overall outcome of what we're trying to accomplish in this class? Uh, Jason, just for today, I was just curious about the group assignment. Uh, the big thing is like, so we're coming up with as a group with our own mission statement. And are we doing anything with like creating our own policies today? And then the final part, just we're indicating which platform we want to use. Yeah, the, today is uh, the, there's really only an individual job, and that's your mission statement today. I want you to look at your own club. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, so the, the activity here, there's, it's just a pass or fail. Um, that's just a, a suggestion that you guys chat with one another. And, oh, okay. You know, everybody say, hey, I'll look at Wix. You look at WordPress, you look at Google Sites, let's come to some some consensus, maybe uh, help each other find the best um, uh, site. So there's not really any grade on that group work, it's just more or less to, to work with each other. Okay, get some ideas going, cool. Yeah, for sure, and that's it. And it's, you know, we're gonna be at this for another two weeks if uh, as you slowly, what I would recommend you guys do every day, once the, once the web page is built and you've got that platform ready, as soon as I've, graded or as soon as you're done an assignment that's complete, load it into your website. 
and uh, then the final day of classes is is a uh, total breeze. You should be done. Perfect. Yeah. Cool. Um, let's see. I'll just check here. Any other questions from the floor? Okay. Well, none heard. Guys, it's about 10 o'clock. So what I'll do is this is what we'll, we'll get you to do. There's your assignments are clear today. You've got uh, lots of, if you open up these, oh, that's not a book. Don't need to look at that. If we open up these books, you'll see they're not particularly long, but you'll have, sam I've got samples posted in here. These might be um, look like chapters, but they're not very long. So have a look, breeze through, make sure you have, uh, you take advantage of all the resources that are built in there. And uh, um, it'll, I think it'll help you finish up these assignments. So, uh, and then of course, after you've done your mission statement today, and after you've had a pretty good idea of what kind of web page you want to use, um, dig into tomorrow. Uh, I'll ask you to read B1, B2, and B3. Uh, this is another uh, article that you can read if you like. Again, all for um, um, just supporting information. Um, and also, if you don't mind, the GCSAA has, um, because of COVID, has opened up their resources to students, knowing that we're all working online these days. So signing up is free. Uh, I've used a bunch of, um, of uh, there's webinars, there's lots of resources that are available at the American uh, Golf Course Humor Tents Association of America website that are accessible to you. So I would urge you guys all to uh, sign up and uh, take advantage of all those. They'll definitely help. There's a bunch of really good chapters on um, course standards and best management practice in there that I think will help. Um, not to mention, for those of you that are coming back next year and plan on coming to the Turf Bowl uh, in Vegas next year, you have to be GCSA members, so you might as well sign up now while it's free. Uh, that's pretty much it for me for now, guys. I think um, I hope everything is fairly clear for you. What I'll do um, from this point forward is I'll turn my microphone off and I'll turn on some uh, music to let you know that I'm still here. You can reach. I'll, I'll be able to hear you over the mic or off the. Um, um, watching the chat box. If you have any questions, you can call me directly or you can email me directly or use the messaging, Moodle messaging system if you've got a private question to ask. Um, in terms of your uh, individual groups, I believe you have experience already setting up your own Google Hangouts if you prefer to uh, work in, in groups that way. Does anybody have any other alternatives as to working in your groups? Uh, I think it worked well just after we finished our lectures with Dave and Ian, we kind of broke into our little four person groups and um, Dave was having us actually invite him into our chats if we needed them. And um, he started a sign up sheet there kind of towards the end of the class um, for breakout sessions. So if, if you wanted him for the next day, you could sign up at a certain time and then send him an invite and he would come and join your Google chat. Yep. Um, that's, that sort of worked. Um, and I don't know, I, I think that uh, probably most people will break off into their own little groups to kind of get organized, I'd imagine. Yeah. Well, hey, if you'd like me to join your group for a discussion or otherwise, just send, I'm, I'm at my desk anyway. So send me an invite and I'll chime right in. And if, uh, if I'm already in a group or I've got, I'm already talking to another uh, breakout session, I'll just send you a message to the chat box and say, hey, I'll be with you in a few minutes. Awesome. That, that sounds really good. Cool. Uh, any other questions, you guys? All right. Well, none heard. Oh, Antonio, you got a question there? No, I was just going to say I'm good. Okay, beauty. Nice, Tony. <laughs> right on, guys. Okay, well, hey, let's uh, let's break. I'll get you to um, start into your mission statements. Do some little investigation. Um, just to before I before I leave you, um, whenever you're making uh, comments on what I'm asking you here, staffing fees and revenues, be sure to validate them with your website, whether it's a link or otherwise. Um, I want to be able to. Uh, I would love to be able to follow up, check out your website. And so I can, when I give you feedback, it's relevant and it's realistic. So uh, that's all I ask. Include your um, 
the link to your website if you have a, a mission statement on there uh, so I can quickly review it and, and not just help with the feedback. Cool. Well, thanks, guys. I'm going to uh, turn off my microphone, turn on some music, and I'll let you go at it. Um, I'm here if you need me. Awesome. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, thanks Jason. Yeah.